Well, hello folks. Here we are again with another teeny tiny technical tutorial from NoSLLC. Uh, that is me and my uh, cohorts in crime. I want to talk about an issue here known as uh, POTS is kaput. Yeah, I made that up. But it's really true. POTS is going away. So I guess we need to do a number of things. Uh, for one, for those of you who don't know what POTS stands for, we're going to look at that. And... Um, why you should care. So without further ado, let's launch into the issue because I've got two parts to it. I'm going to make you aware of what the issue is and then I'm going to give you in part number two um, some of the kinds of services that are going to be affected. Um, that'll be a bit of techie stuff. I'll show you where wires go and how this stuff works. So what's up with this? Well, there's big changes uh, occurring in the telecom industry, even bigger than they have been over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, and these changes are driven by legalities and um, money issues. Um, the legality part is the FCC and the PUCs are telling the phone companies, you better start providing a broadband everywhere. Well, de definitely POTS is not broadband. What does that What does that actually mean? It means everybody should be able to use a computer and look stuff up very quickly, right? I guess that's what it kind of means. But it also supports lots and lots of other services much more efficiently than these old wire base uh, systems. And POTS is one, and that's the reason I started doing this little video because I got sucked into this issue. And I'll show you more about that later on. So what is POTS? Well that's your grandma's phone. Yeah, They're still around. Um, I saw one estimate that says we've still got as many POTS, plain old telephone service lines in existence right now as we did in 1920. That's a lot of phone lines but um, certainly uh, cell phones have taken over most of uh, voice communications but so so we want to deal with that uh, alarms it turns out that a lot of alarm systems can't work on these newer um, wire uh, wireless based systems they they need wire so we'll look at some of those issues later on in the techie part and then there's a whole bunch of special services and like ring downs. You pick up a phone at one place and it rings in another place. Junkyard circuits. Uh, the guy gets it, picks up that greasy phone and shouts to every other junkyard in the nation. Do you have a piece for a 1942 Ford pickup? Well, I hope not because I don't think they made pickups in 1942. But anyway, there's lots of special service kinds of circuits. And then number two, cellular base, um, there's a big change coming. And once again, we just got hit with this ourselves. I had to change phones. I had to buy a new phone because G, uh, generation 3 or 3G is being phased out, guaranteed. Um, I think the date was supposed to be like in a couple more days, the beginning of 2022. So if you've got an old phone, which you may have, we did, and your service suddenly stops because ours kept dropping out, we were forced to buy a new phone. And anyway, I'll give you more about that later. Um, and there's not enough cells to support all the stuff that uh, the phone companies are supposed to do. Uh -huh. So there's lots of legal issues uh, um, around all of this. Uh, as far as getting rid of wire base, um, moving to something else for your communication service. And then one more thing, and this one is not quite as well known, I don't think. Um, there's a massive shift from going from, to, from circuit switch to packet routed, not packet switched. There is a difference, a technical difference. Um, so by moving to... Um, these packet routed and getting rid of the old circuit switched kinds of switches, the phone companies can make money, right? So it once again it comes back to money and technology. So there's new newer types of um, non-circuit switch that can support voice and non-voice transmission. And the thing that most people keep 
talking about is VoIP, voice over IP. Basically, that just means you're packetizing your voice and sending it using little packets, little packages. And then short or multimedia message services. So, so much of that now is going on. I mean, if you're old enough, you can see all the changes that are happening. But the ones we're really concerned about are the people who are getting going to be left behind or have been left behind or will be left behind. Um, by these changes. So that's what we're going to explore a little more fully. As to the legal uh, aspects that are pushing this, um, it all comes back down to the um, 1934 Communications Act of 1934, which has been updated to, to the 1996. And when you read through this 1934 document, it's like 330 pages. My gosh. Uh, it's really, really dense, just like every other legal documentation. You read down half the way down a page, and then the rest of the, ha the page is all references to other legal documents. So between the uh, 1934 Act and the 1996 Act, and then this other little document I have over on the right, FCC 19-72, just to show you some of the issues involved. And if you really want to get involved, um, and have your eyes glaze over. Pull these yourself. You can you can download them. They're you know public documents, public records. So anyway, that's who's pushing it. And of course, the phone companies are going along with it. Is that the right way to put it? No, they really want to change out this old stuff. It's expensive to maintain. Um, they want to move to the new stuff, right? So they can make even more money. It's always the name of the game. I did give you a little bit of a close-up on that introduction for that previous FCC 19-72 that's down here, um, this drive to the broadband. Uh, there were a number of objections um, to um, allowing the phone companies to basically get rid of the old POTS lines um, on the timelines that they were supposed to do. So there has this uh, other piece you might hear about, so you'll know what it is, what is forbearance. That just means that if enough people will complain, I guess, and enough money is behind it, they can slow this down at particular places, uh, depending on the, quote, should circumstances warrant. Now, so you can go find the, the footnote on that one, too, if you really like. Here's my final slide on the awareness issue, trying to make everybody aware of what's going on. Um, I've given you some uh, news articles from various um, websites. All you have to do is uh, type in that um, title of the news article, like the top one says circuit switching versus packet switching. If you do that, you're probably going to come up with a, a several different ones. The ones I was referring to is uh, from lifewire.com. So if you type in these uh, various um, titles, you'll come up with a bunch of interesting stuff and it'll give you a much broader perspective uh, than what I'm going to show you in the, in the physical part coming up. The one I really thought uh, was very interesting was the one down on the lower right hand side it says Verizon's refusal to repair landline services leaves elderly man without phone service. And this is a really good one because it um, shows you that there's actually several different things going on. Uh, with the retirement of these kinds of services. One is they just, the phone companies want, won't put new service in under these old uh, formats. And the other part is they won't repair any of the stuff. Um, so you can't fix it once it breaks. Um, that's a really good article that uh, covers a number of those different issues. So what's going on here? Well, a couple of things with my little drawing on the right hand side. If you get rid of uh, circuit switches, you effectively got rid of landline or POTS lines. I mean, that's just what's going to happen. If you get rid of this, that kind of a switch, you've automatically gotten rid of the uh, POTS lines. So even if that stays around for another, you know, five, six, ten, ten years, they're just not going to be supporting wire based POTS telephone service. So we're all going to be up on something else, which is going to be huh, wideband. Huh? Can you make phone calls over wideband? Of course you can. 
And there's a number of different ways to do that, but the one most of us are familiar with that's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger is um, cellular, either on mobile, my little guy in the green car, or, well, I guess you could say that your handset's mobile too. Mobile too. Um, and later on in the next slide or two or three, I'll show you that uh, the little lady down there is uh, going to go away for the example that we're going to show. So take a look at a number of these um, documentations on what's going on. I think you'll get a much broader picture of why this might you know, affect you or someone you know. And uh, so ends part one. For those of you who are not interested in the technical stuff, that is, where do these wires go? What do the wires do? How are they put together? What kind of services are on these wires? Yeah. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, I'm not sure how long the other piece of this is going to go, so I guess I'll find out uh, over time how many people continue to watch from this point on. But anyway, thanks for watching. Those who are giving up, don't care about the tech, um, look for some of my stuff that may interest you, uh, not related to this. And um, for those of you who are ready to go some more, here we go. Well, here we go into a little bit more technical detail about uh, the words I used a little while ago. Um, circuit switched and packet switched, or actually packet routed. What's the difference and why should we care? Um, well, it helps if you understand why things are going the way they're going. So let's look at the left side, the thing called circuit switching, circuit switch. Um, in the original old electromechanical switches, there was a physical connection that you could physically trace from one phone to the other when a call was up. And all those little pieces, those little physical connections stayed up for the length of time the call was in progress. So you establish a physical circuit through the matrix from one set of copper wires, tip and ring, um, through the switch matrix physically and then out on tip and ring to the pink phone down on the lower left hand side. So you establish a physical circuit and no other uh, calls can use any of those physical pieces in that switch. Now over the years they got more and more into electronic kinds of connections but the concept was still the same. You tied up the path through that switch by creating a circuit from one phone to the other. All right, move over to the right hand side which is where we are pushing very very hard, have been for years and it's just becoming overwhelming that that's where we're going to, going to go in the telecom network is that the information from one phone to the other, in this case I'm showing that it's going over a cellular system and everybody says well that's VoIP. Well yes because that's the way it's put together nowadays but in a voice over IP call or a routed call your, your conversation is not one continuous stream even if you're not talking on the left one the connection was still up even if you're not talking on the right hand side you your your voice is packaged into little chunks we'll, we'll call them packets um, and those little packets contain pieces of your conversation, little sometimes just syllables, and those are sent as little packages, little packets more like the mail service. Each one has an address and that goes up in this case from the upper right to the lower left. That's one conversation, but you see I don't have a hard physical connection. I have little pieces that are going all through the network. Once again, more like letters in the US mail service. This is much much more efficient because the matrix is not tied up continuously on a call that may not be actually saying anything. And that's the way we've been doing stuff data for a long long time but until the last few years the the transmission facilities in this case cellular or even something like a wire you could put the stuff on wire um, <clears throat> wasn't adequate until we got fiber optics or uh, wideband cellular radio 
um, or some other thing, it wasn't very efficient in terms of voice quality. Some of you who used to use um, your internet connection for making free phone calls use this. And we all know, because many of us tried it, the quality was terrible. Well, that's because the switchers were not fast enough, the routers, that is, were not fast enough, and the uh, facilities, the physical facilities, were not adequate to carry that much traffic. So there's lots of delays and yeah, that kind of stuff. So now we know what it is, right? Circuit switch, very inefficient. Packet switch, packet routed, much more efficient use of facilities and mapping or routing, or if you want, switching. So I put this slide in to sh just show that um, the simple statement that POTS is going to go away actually has huge ripples. Um, the phone installers won't be installing phones. Uh, cable splicers won't have as much cable because uh, eventually everything will go to fiber or radio, right? Uh, no test board techs, circuit switch techs, special service techs. That's what I was for many, many years. Um, also, power requirements change a lot because the uh, uh, circuit switch uh, switches supply dial tone and power out to the uh, phones, ringier, all that kind of stuff. Uh, once you go to uh, no cables going out to controlled environmental vaults, um, your power requirements drop off too, if you happen to have those. So there's a lot of things that are going to affect a, a lot of folks in the industry. But uh, back to this uh, other thing, specifically about, uh, well, what happens when POTS goes away? Well, down in my lower right-hand corner of my little drawing, you'll see that I've got uh, an old-fashioned phone, but it's connected to a modem. And what that does is it allows you to maintain your same service that you had on POTS, we hope, um, by using a cellular connection. I know that that uh, doesn't actually always work because I just am in the midst of right now trying to get that kind of service functioning. So there's some of the headaches that uh, the people being taken off of pots are going to have if they try to do something like go up on cellular. But anyway, it can be done. That's why I put that little drawing down there. So I've used the term a whole bunch, plain old telephone service. This is what it was. Coming out of the telephone company office, the central office, the local exchange, you had two wires, a tipper wire and a ring wire. You put a battery on the ring and you put a ground on the tip out to the phone. And when you pick up the phone, you could talk because that battery supplied that ability. <clears throat> it was two wires called a tip and ring because um, the uh, little plug that you use had a tip part, a ring part, and a sleeve, which almost nobody ever used. But anyway, so the talk battery came from the local exchange or the central office or the dial tone office. Um, the ringing uh, voltage was supply, supplied that made your phone ring. It came from the telephone company central office. But uh, the supervision to make calls came from the phone, off hook, on hook, that kind of stuff. And the signaling, meaning telling the phone company where you wanted to to uh, call to was either dial pulse ra -ta 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 -ra -ta 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 like that 10 pulses per second or dual tone multi frequency usually you call touch tone um, that came from the phone also and everything was owned by the phone company including the phone kind of unusual in today's environment isn't it so that's pots battery and ground on twisted pair two wires actually tip and ring and this is the way that POTS, metallic, on tip and ring, twisted pair, works. Is we got a Bell operating company here, Bell Co., um, local exchange carrier. And the t tip and ring wires come out of the service. Uh, in this case, I'm showing provides a dial tone out on a tip and ring to the top phone, right? If they pick it up, they go off hook like the bottom phone did. So every one of these phones is attached to a specific piece of equipment in the local exchange. Um, nobody else gets to use that wire. 
um, and typically there would be a big cable that a whole bunch of these services would go into like a 600 pair cable and then they'd go out to distribution boxes which we typically call B boxes because the little splicer things that they use look like tiny little thimbles they were called beanies um, that's why some old guys you'll, you'll still hear, hear us talk about B boxes but they're distribution boxes and we'd split up that 600 pair and maybe run out on 25 pair to um, you know, some local area that had a s smaller number of phones no more than 25 um, and there'd be multiple 25 pair cables coming out of that uh, distribution or B box but physically from the phone into the office if you yanked really really hard right the phone would the phone would cause the telephone office to go whoa, 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 wiggle back a uh, bit of an exaggeration so physical connection tip and ring battery and ground the other side of that uh, shows uh, long distance um, trunks trunks are just connections between switches so when you make a call that's not local that is from the top phone down to the bottom phone you had to go out on a trunk and we don't need to get too far into that so physicality this is a POTS just a standard old POTS okay let me show you a supercharged uh, local loop dial tone kind of service as opposed to what we did years ago when you wanted to send data over your phone line you uh, bought yourself a modem down at the uh, whiz bang tech store and you plug your computer into the modem and the modem would convert that digital signal into analog tones that would go out over your POTS line. It was called dial-up. Pretty slow stuff. Um, well, around the late 80s or so, Bell Labs, I can't remember the guy's name, came up with this uh, idea for what's called a DSL or digital subscriber line. And what that really is is a souped-up POTS, um, sometimes called data over voice. That makes sense when you know what the technology is. Um, so in that case what happened or happens is that the voice and the data that you want to send and receive is uh, moved sli slid pop I don't know jammed into a D slam the D slam digital subscriber line access multiplexer and that would um, effectively do two things it would take the voice and pass it through effectively with no change at all in the four kilohertz band because that's what voice service typically was was and still is and then it would take the data because it is in fact um, running digital stuff and running into the d slam and they'd convert it into analog at frequencies above the voice frequency of uh, zero to four kilohertz and out at the other end you had to have a little box that could separate the voice frequency for kilohertz or so and send it to your phone and pull out the higher frequencies representing the data stick it through a modem which converts the analog tones back into digital to go over to your your uh, computer and then of course vice versa your computer digital stuff goes into the modem gets converted into these high frequency tones that are still within the capability of your pots two wire loop and then the D slam pulls it apart sends your voice up to the voice part dial tone all that kind of stuff and um, converts back into digital uh, for the digital application so you can you know surf the net or whatever you want so it's kind of like a souped up pots lots of people are on this it was originally um, AT&T's U-verse but around Oct uh, I'm not even sure October 2016 I don't have the exact date but 2016 they renamed this stuff um, into AT&T internet and AT&T phone well guess what uh, October 1st 2020 they said we're not going to supply this service anymore you can't order it but um, lots of people are grandfathered on it so if you think you have uverse or you have the newer name AT&T internet and AT&T phone yeah you might have it but uh, as soon as they start chopping up the copper cable you won't have it okay let's look at uh, some other things that are still metallic right? still, still on 
tip and ring, twisted pair. Could even be uh, four four wires, two pairs, right? Tip and ring, tip and ring. Well, usually called tip and ring and tip one ring one. But anyway, we'll stick with just two wire right now. So there's our same layout, 600 pair going out to 25 pairs, multiples. Um, special services, there's many of them, and they don't go through the switch. They actually just come into the office and then go back out. And they come from you know, some customers out here. I got Big Bubba's alarm service because alarm services are kind of tricky to get on anything other than physical wire. And then uh, Hackers Haven and Pot Shop, limited liability company, um, those guys uh, just wanted computer stuff so they could uh, send and receive orders for more pot, yeah, something like that. So that's a special service. Doesn't go to, through dial tone, doesn't do anything, just goes into the central office from some outlying location through the central office on physical wire. You just punch the wires down. I know I built many of these kinds of services out on the wire out to the customer's location and then they put a, whatever they want on the end of it. Um, that's a metallic hard wire circuit and good luck trying to change some of these things over. It gets real tricky to change them over to non-physical wire. So just an example of special service. Lots of examples still out there yet another service that's on wire still on wire been that way for a long time um, this is like an extension um, let's say that uh, the, the place you want to serve that is get dial tone to is way beyond the capability of a twisted pair of pots standard loop or your customers are out at some distant location 25 30 40 miles away that kind of thing what we do then is we use a multiplexing methodology and the most common one that most people are familiar with, particularly the ones that um, are like a small business, is a T-type carrier. T-type carrier was an inner office carrier originally. I know I installed my first one in 1965 um, based for trunking, but over the years they got more and more flexible, much better capabilities. So what this does is it multiplexes multiple uh, individual channels in the standard kind of arrangement 24 channels you can carry 24 channels on the original DS1 T1 system um, and it puts them all together all these different services onto four wires a quad a twisted pairs right tip and ring tip on ring one and it sends it a long distance although t-type carrier on wire actually needs a regenerator about a, every 6,000 feet once again I put in tons of these things um, but you still go through the usual stuff of get the get off a big cable out to a smaller cable and finally out to the customers well then you have to go back into another multiplexer or demultiplexer depending on which direction you're looking at a t-type that matches it and you pull this stuff out as individual phones uh, and go through um, yet another uh, distribution, the little green box on the right to, before you go out to the phones, because you have to drop back out to tip and ring two wire to the phones, right? Or to the data applications or whatever. Now that means then that the T-type carrier multiplexer has to supply the talk battery and the ringing generator. The dial tone still comes from the local exchange, but the actual power to make the phone work uh, comes from the T-type carrier um, channel bank or hardware. Or, in this case, I'm showing a thing called a CEV, a controlled environmental vault. Uh, the T-type equipment um, typically is, for these applications, is hanging on a pole in a small container or it could be in a controlled environmental vault. Um, and once again, you have a power issue for the phone company because the T equipment has to be powered somehow. Uh, you can't do it over the wires, with minor exceptions, but you can't do it over the wires. So you need a power uh, supply, uh, you know, 110, 120 volts or even more. And the control environmental vaults uh, can typically uh, provide that they have some kind of connection to the, the local um, power company. So that complicates things. But 
you still are riding on twisted pair wires just in this case four of them to carry as many as 24 conversations or some mixture of that and, and alarm circuits and data circuits and stuff like that so once again if you've got a service like a T coming out to your location you're a small business or even what's called a fractional T um, once once the phone company decides to start getting rid of all wire-based systems this could affect you too if you have that that kind of service okay let's add some complication to your understanding of what wire going away can do um, I've added another uh, local exchange here Cali drip and tinkle phone company that's what we used to call California water and tell it was a little tiny company we maintained their transmission systems um, this gets a little more complicated for a couple of reasons one uh, the bell system has been required for quite some time I know way before actually the decrees that from the FCC is that we had to put uh, competitive um, information streams onto our that is I work for uh, Pac Bell Pacific Bell SBC all the names that they changed over the years uh, we had to allow these competitors to use our facilities like our cables and stuff like that to get out to their customers right yeah there was a lot of consternation over that anyway um, so we had to have uh, access physical access and it could have been and many times was wire from their local exchange to our local exchange so once again wire goes away that connection goes away and then um, even more um, ancient if you will because uh, do you, do you remember when competitive uh, phone service first started it was for long distance um, so if you wanted to make a long distance call on other than AT&T's long distance for instance you had to pick up your phone and dial in an access code and that access code effectively what made a, a local call to local call that is see the purple line coming out of the Belco LEC well that was the link to get you over to the Cali drip and tinkle to get to their long distance trunks right that was the access you had to dial from from Belco dial tone into Cali drip and tinkle and then dial your long distance number very clumsy but it, it went on for a number of years until um, Cali drip and tinkle could physically locate within the Belco LEC and that happened uh, quite a few places so until that consolidation was done you had to dial these access codes and get a, across from one place to the other and if they were on wire guess what those can't work anymore I, I don't know that that would ever happen at this point because everybody's either co-located they don't do this kind of stuff but there could still be some cable stuff out there who knows you know for years and years and years I said nobody uses step switches anymore because uh, General Telephone where I, where I also work maintaining the long distance or switch to switch trunking um, they sold all that stuff off and it went down to Mexico and they put it all back in uh, so no matter what you think how old something could be and not around anymore someplace it's around still okay final word about the physicality thing here I mentioned CEVs uh, here's an example of one I was out walking my dogs the other day and happened to have my phone with me and I said, oh look I, there's a picture of one um, the one on the right is the controlled environmental vault and it's got you know, vents and it's, it comes on every once in a while makes a heck of a lot of noise to cooling vents in there um, inside of there I have no idea what kind of gear they have but it's very possible that um, they've got some T type you know, demultiplexers multiplexers demultiplexers but I can tell you that however they get from the uh, telephone company switching office out to this CEV um, it's unlikely that that is going to be wire it's probably going to be because this is a pretty new location fiber optic um, but if it were wire um, 
who knows, the phone company may decide to move it to fiber optic because uh, they don't want to maintain that wire because it's going to have to have connections, right? B boxes somewhere. Um, but the thing I really want to drive is to the, the local customers, you, the, your pot service. Well, the, the information comes out of that CEV because it's only about five feet away. You can see it's the same kind of bushes. Um, uh, to the distribution box or what I call the B box and in there is nothing but wire and so they connect the individual tip and ring for your phone coming from the CEV to the tip and ring going on the little tiny cable going to another smaller distribution maybe for your block or something like that that pulls out maybe from a 25 pair cable your POTS line all right I have no idea how far down the phone companies are going to chase this because that little distribution box there probably has, I don't know, 8 or 10 or 15 cables coming out of there going to various locations within my uh, housing uh, tract, uh, thousands of houses in this tract. Will the phone company finally get so fed up with trying to fix those local POTS loops out of that distribution that they're going to force everybody off? And I have no idea uh, if it will happen or when it will happen. But just be aware because your, your POTS line, even in these newest systems, is still physical wire maintained by the local phone company if they're going to go that far down. Don't know. Finally, doom and gloom, let me move you over to what I see as possible solutions to this, uh, having your pots poop out. Um, because I'm dealing with this right now, I'm trying to get uh, a, a friend of ours situated where he has reasonable, decent phone service because he doesn't have it now. Um, if your pots poops out, I would suggest if you have it, you have cable service because that's my suggestion to him and your phone doesn't work anymore but your TV and your internet does, guess what? Call up your, your internet company and say, or your cable company and say, hey, I'd like to have a bundle. Usually you can get it cheaper and uh, have your phone come out of the cable company instead of the telephone company, right? If you have cable. Well, what if you don't? Well, this answer pops up over and over and over again as the um, balance, the counterbalance to having your physical pots taken away. And that's part of the FCC regulation is there has to be something there that is adequately parallel to your pots. And that is to move to what's called fixed wireless. And I'll show you a couple examples of the hardware that can do that. Um, we won't go into any detail on it. but. And then finally, you could beg your local exchange to put your put fiber into your home. Yeah, good luck with that. That uh, fiber is not being put in like the phone company said that, that it would be. There's a lot of articles on that too um, that uh, maybe you've read already. Uh, you might go back to carrier pigeons or how about this one? Set fire to your phone and use it as smoke signals. Oh, that's a little I know. Um, so let me show you a couple of the boxes that can be used if you have decent cell phone power service. That is, the signal coming in is okay because that's what we're running into here also is the signals just are not strong enough to be uh, consistently uh, usable. Now the next couple of slides are uh, some examples and certainly there are many more than this of uh, how you could move to fixed wireless. Um, and I'm not going to go through any of the details. You can just put the slide on hold to read through it. Um, this is one of them. It may or may not be available in your area. Uh, this one was the only one I could actually find uh, the retail price if you buy it. Well, you're going to have to buy it yourself anyway, I think, because most of the services um, don't include the hardware. And, of course, you have to have a phone. This one's very clever. Uh, all these boxes have multiple antennas sticking up on them. They look like you know, Bugs Bunny gone crazy. Um, I thought this was very clever. They got a, a 
a uh, trademark, registered trademark for this term, pots in a box. This was a genius uh, for their salespeople. This one looks really cool. You should look this one up. Uh, it's a nifty little white box, and it's supposed to be compatible with just about everything. Uh, not available until sometime next year, 2022. Now, <laughs> obviously you're still listening, so you must have been interested enough in this to uh, listen to me drone on for way over 40 minutes now. Um, it was just intended when I first started as a heads up about uh, putting in a fixed wireless because of my friend trying to get his stuff, his uh, alarm system, help I fall and I can't get up uh, and all that uh, set up and we just ran into all kinds of problems and then I started delving into it and discovered how big this actually is for a lot of people uh, and that's why I ended up doing this rather lengthy thing was to explain to what's the overview who needs to be concerned and then a little bit about the kind of service that it actually is so that maybe you can recognize that you are in some possible uh, danger of losing what you've had for many many years and that is a metallic pots line so goodbye and good luck <laughs>